Without a doubt, there are people alive today because of the work of our next guest, Dr. Marcus Conant of the Conant Foundation and one of the first physicians to treat people living with AIDS. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, we were talking before the cameras went on about uh, when you first started working with people with AIDS, HIV. Do you remember the first person you diagnosed? Yeah, the first, I, I remember the first person I saw who had AIDS mm -hmm. that we realized in retrospect it was AIDS. Mm -hmm. That was in 1978. Now remember we didn't recognize the That's epidemic. three years before the New York Times article. You got it. <clears throat> we didn't recognize the epidemic until 81. But this friend who owned a bar here in town uh, was brought to my office because of a splitting headache and worse than a migraine. And he was running a fever. I didn't know what was wrong with him, but he was a vet. So I sent him to the Veterans Hospital. He was there in coma for about six months until he died. At autopsy, he had tuberculosis of the brain. Now, at that time, nobody dies of tuberculosis uh -huh. of the brain. At that time, we had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. But he died of AIDS. Mm -hmm. But the first case that I saw was someone whose name I can use because he was on the cover of Newsweek was Bobby Campbell. Mm -hmm. Bobby Campbell was a nurse at UC Hospital. And I saw him in February of 81 with a horrible case of shingles, Soster. Mm -hmm. In September of 81, he came to my office with bilateral purple lesions on the bottoms of his feet. And it was Kaposi's sarcoma. Uh -huh. And that's when it began. And I started seeing patients with Kaposi's sarcoma. I was a dermatologist as you know, mm -hmm. and I had been practicing 16 years here in San Francisco. I had actually helped describe the epidemic of genital herpes at the Haight-Ashbury Clinic mm -hmm. in the early 60s. Well, then one valley over, from the Haight over to the Castro, we have another epidemic of a virally transmitted, sexually transmitted disease. But the difference between herpes and this is while herpes is an inconvenience and is emotionally devastating mm -hmm. and is terrible, this was fatal. And so it was necessary to get out into the community and try to stop the disease. Yeah, in, in looking back over 30 years of, of uh, treating people in the AIDS, HIV era, is there one moment that sticks out when you think that was the depth yeah. of it? Yeah. No, I haven't been asked that in a long time. That was in 87. I was at a meeting in Park City, Utah listening to the work on vaccines. And I realized we weren't going to see a vaccine. Because up until that point, we thought that this was going to be something like toxic shock syndrome. That we can treat and find we're, a vaccine we're, we're for. We're going to find something for this, and it's going to be over. You know, when Gallo met with Margaret Heckler in March of 85. Uh, Anthony Gallo. Uh, Tony Gallo, that's yeah. right. Tony, uh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Bob Gallo. Yeah, yeah. Well, Bob Gallo uh, and Margaret Heckler mm -hmm. announced that they had an ELISA test that they could test the blood for HIV. And <clears throat> so they, the press asked him, how long will it be before we had a vaccine? He said, two years. Well, that was 85, mm -hmm. and we still don't have a vaccine, and we don't have a promise for a vaccine. I was just at Croy, the, the, the big AIDS meeting in Seattle, and there's some glimmer of hope. But we are years away from seeing an HIV vaccine. You know, li listening to you talk about it in the same language that you talked about it 30 years ago and when I moved here in the mid-1980s and AIDS with a death sentence, you don't hear it talked about this way anymore. It's, not a, it's not a death sentence anymore. Yeah, and but it is, still, it is still a terminal disease, is it not? No. It, it, if you're treated, mm -hmm. it's not a terminal disease. But, of course, you need to be treated early. Now, couple of reasons for being treated early. Number one, we know that if you treat a patient and you get his viral load undetectable, he or she is no longer infectious to their sexual partner. Now think about what that means. That means that we could stop this epidemic tomorrow. We could treat our way out of the AIDS epidemic just as we treated ourselves out of the tuberculosis epidemic in the 1930s and 40s. Mm -hmm. We could do it. But this government is not interested. Well, I was going to say that. so. The so the question. I mean, to go back to my original point of to hear you talk about it, it is as serious a health issue, in its own way, as it was 30 years ago. But yet, I know as a gay man, uh, now married, um, I see men who look a lot like me in their 20s treating AIDS like it's not serious anymore. Right. And that just breaks my heart. One pill once a day and you're just fine. Well, uh -huh. you're not just fine uh -huh. because if you don't get treated early, if you don't find out. And some people are actually waking up in an emergency room, finding out they have AIDS. Mm -hmm.
But if you don't get treated early, your immune system has been partially destroyed. And in many patients, it does not fully recover once we put them on treatment. Mm -hmm. But worse than that, it's still something you have to live with the rest of your life. And so you have to take one pill once a day. Now, the pill we use right now, 84% uh, of the patients go on a triple, which is the medication they use. Most of your viewers probably are mm -hmm. on a triple or know mm -hmm. someone mm -hmm. on a triple. Mm -hmm. Well, a triple costs $58 a pill. $58 a pill. So it's that's an expensive tw treatment. $20,000 a year just for that one pill. You may have other medications you have to take as well, and you have your doctor's visits, your lab fees. You're looking at $30,000 or more per year that someone has to pay. Mm -hmm. you, and even if you have every coverage in the world, you're still having an outlay, and you have to go to the doctors, and you have to remember to take the pills, and if you forget, then you start failing on your treatments, and you have to go to more expensive, more complex, and less friendly drugs. Right. So what would you say to someone who no longer thinks that AIDS, HIV is uh, a serious issue who, and I'm talking not only to potential patients, but other people maybe in the medical profession who think, you know, now we're on to other things. Yeah. It's, it's no longer the disease now, of the moment. Let me tell you a story, which, which your viewers I think will love. A dear friend of mine, a boyfriend from many years ago, who I'm still very close to, um, had an eye problem. And I was vacationing in France, and he called me and said, I have an eye problem. And I said, go see an eye doctor. So he went to see an eye doctor up north of San Francisco, about an hour and a half drive. And he told the doctor, as he should, that he was HIV positive. And the man said, how long have you been positive? And he said, oh, I don't know. I got positive about 1985. And the doctor said, oh, well, you're probably well by now. Why don't you stop your medicine? This was a doctor, doctor. recommending that an AIDS patient stop his medication. Mm -hmm. No, there are plenty of doctors out there that do not understand how to treat this disease. Mm -hmm. And what does that do to you when you hear a story like that? It reinforces what you and I have been talking about yeah. for 30 years. Yeah. Is th This is a very complex disease. You really need a specialist that knows what he's doing in treating this disease. Uh, and the point you were trying to make earlier is, is, is a very good one. People treat this with a very cavalier approach right now. And it is not a casual thing. People should use condoms. They should get tested regularly. And if they're positive, they should get on treatment as, as soon as they can. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it distresses me as someone who moved here when I was single and 20-something, now that I'm married and 50, to hear young gay men treat this like a pimple. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what to do. I mean, when I was, a, when I was here in the you know, 1980s and early 1990s, you could not go a day without hearing a public service mess, uh, announcement. And there's none of that anymore. There's none of the, that anymore. That's great. How, how important or how dangerous is the linkage between new HIV infections and casual drug use, specifically in the it, gay community? It's, everyone will tell you it's a huge problem because and it, it's, it's, it's not too hard to understand. <clears throat> the, the, the drug of choice is crystal meth, mm -hmm. TINA, as it's called by my patients. And they go out on Friday night. They get high as a kite. Mm -hmm. They wear condoms the first hour or two. Mm -hmm. Then the condoms get lost. Mm -hmm. They keep having sex. Sunday morning, they no longer can get an erection. Mm -hmm. Then they take a Viagra and more Tina. Mm -hmm. We sell more Viagra to young men in San Francisco than we do to old to men. seniors. Mm -hmm. So they can have the round-the-clock round yeah. round sex, right. and, then, and then their judgment gets impaired. And then they go home and crash, and a day or two later, they've got to go to work Monday morning. So what do they do to go to work? They have another little bump of Tina. Mm -hmm. They do more speed. And two weeks of that, three weeks of that, of partying on the weekend, using speed during the week to get up and go to work, mm -hmm. and they're hooked. Mm -hmm. And so now you've got an addiction problem and a medical problem. Exactly. Now, and so, let me just point out, too, the addiction problem, as you said in your is not a medical problem. It's a social problem. Right. And we keep trying to treat addiction as if it's a medical problem. And it's a social it's issue. It's a whole social issue. Talk to me about the work of the Conant Foundation. Why did you set it up, and how is that different from the work you've been doing medically over the last 30 years? Well, the, the foundation that as it exists now, I actually started a foundation that became the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. Mm -hmm. So this is actually the third foundation. That you started, I, I right. started. The first one with your name on it. <laughs> right. right. Th this one was started because we were trying to reach out to gay men in San Francisco with a focused message. You know, this is what you need to do not to be infected. This is what you need to do if you're co-infected with hepatitis C and HIV. This is what you need to do if you are infected to get proper treatment. 
the internet came along and those community forums died. We mm -hmm. don't have community forums anymore because people don't go to them. They go online. Uh, they go online. What is good and bad. The good part is they can go online and find out what they need to know like this. The bad part is if they start hearing something they don't want to hear, they're one mouse click away from cutting it off. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a mixed message. But it became obvious that we were no longer reaching the gay community, that what we needed to do was to reach young heterosexual kids. Remember that gay men, active gay men who are engaged in receptive anal sex, which is the highest risk factor, are only about 4% of the population. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the straight community is 96% of the population. Now we're beginning to get a heterosexual epidemic in America. It's not as fast as Africa, and we could spend an hour talking about why that is, mm -hmm. but it's going to happen. It's happening. Right now, if you take the demographics, 40% of the new cases are gay men, roughly 10% are IV drug users, 27% are women, 16% are heterosexual, non-IV drug using men. Which is higher than it was during the worst years of the gay, quote unquote, AIDS epidemic. It, it, the, the heterosexual epidemic is going up, the gay epidemic is going down mm -hmm. in numbers. Now, gay men are still the greatest group at risk, but this is slowly becoming a heterosexual epidemic. But where is it? Mm -hmm. It's in the black and Hispanic community. In our last few moments, Tell me what advice you would give to specifically a heterosexual person who thinks that AIDS is not their problem. Get tested. No, no matter how straight you are or how faithful you are, remember that everybody you have sex with, you're having sex with every person they've ever had sex with before. Mm -hmm. And so straight people should be tested annually as part of their routine annual physical exam. Right. How do you get through, though, with all the barrage of information? I mean, you've got, you know, 400 cable channels. It's no longer just you read this paper, you're going to get information. How do you make people feel this is important still? Well, what, the, what our foundation is doing now is we are putting on programs in schools, trying to have the entire senior class as peer educators of each other, and then the whole class is tested at the end of this five-week period and it works like a charm. The kids come in, they learn it's just a buckle swab, it destigmatizes it. Mm -hmm. Because remember, no one boy is going to go walking in to be tested. Everybody will say, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh -huh. But if the whole class walks in, you remove the stigma. Peer pressure can work the other way. Precisely. Thanks for being on the show with us. Thank you so much. We've been speaking with Dr. Marcus Conant, whom we will have back to talk about the continuing danger of the AIDS HIV epidemic. Next up, we're going to meet Lisa Starr and talk about how your pet can be restored to health.